All right, everyone, Seth Godin. Thank you, Mark. It's been such a pleasure to know you through these years, and I'm thrilled to be here with the creme de la creme, the top of the profession. Uh, I have a rant, and it starts with a question, which is, what do you make? Someone might ask you that at a dinner party, what do you make back when we had dinner parties? And you could think they're asking, what do you make in salary? But really, they're saying, like, what do you do all day? And if you look at your calendar, you might say, well, what I do all day is handle logistics, argue about price, or make sales. Because I'm pretty sure you're not sitting there running the button making machine or feeding things into the dye sublimation printer. I don't think that's what you make. I think what you make is stories. I think that there's always going to be somebody who's a little faster and a little cheaper than you at matching the RFP. There's always going to be somebody who's eager to race to the bottom. But telling stories, stories that resonate with the person who is working with you or for the person who's receiving what you worked on, telling stories, that is rare. That is scarce. So first, I want to start with B2B. What's the difference between B2B selling and selling to a consumer? It's simple. When you sell to a consumer, they're spending their money. And so all of the drama and all of the overhead of money kicks in. When you're selling to a business, they're spending the boss's money. And what that means is the only question they're asking themselves is, what will I tell my boss? And if they need it to be cheaper, what that means is you haven't given them a better story. Unless there's a better story, the default story to tell your boss is either I bought what we bought last year because you were so smart to pick it, or I got the cheapest one. Neither of those is going to help you. What your client needs from you is a good story to tell their boss, a story about insight and perseverance and wisdom and status, a story about belong whatever that person needs in their career. That is the story that we make for them. And what about the end user, the person who gets the thing that we helped create, right? What is the story that person is telling themselves? In my closet, I have a tie that Alan Weber and Bill Taylor gave me 21 years ago. No mustard will ever get on this tie. And every time I put on my Fast Company tie, I tell myself a story, a story about a day that changed my life. And a few years after that, the head of Yahoo Italy when I was at Yahoo, gave me a tie, purple and yellow stripe. And every time I put that tie on, I tell myself a story. And like you, I have been gifted lots and lots of stuff. But like you, I have enough stuff. We don't want more stuff. We want a story that's going to resonate with us. And so this gets to the heart of your career, which is that there's, I don't know, I'm going to make this up, a million people who are going to buy the kinds of stuff that gets churned out by the factories that produce this stuff. But you don't need a million customers. You don't even need 100,000 customers or 10,000 customers. You might only need 500 customers this year. The smallest viable audience, the smallest group of people who have in common something that they need to hear from you, something that they need to create, a way they need to be in the world. That If we're going to race to the top, we're going to get there not by decrying or shaming the people who are racing to the bottom. We're going to get there by making it clear that some people want the status that comes from getting the kind of thing that you and only you can make. And that status, what we measure all day, every day, who's up, who's down, who am I with, who am I next to, where am I affiliated? That is the metric. Profit, price, that's stuff we make up to go around it that what you get is the chance to do work that matters for people who care. And if they don't care, you can't make them care. Move on. And here's how I can tell if you're serious about the smallest viable audience. How many times in the last week did you give a prospect somebody else's phone number, somebody else's web address? How many times did you say, oh, I hear you. You're looking for that sort of thing. We don't do that. They do that. We do this. And it's not the physical object you make that's the this. It's the story. It's the process. It's the experience. It's what will I tell my boss. The way we do our work, the interactions we have, is far more important than the actual object. 
and the object and the process around it, that practice of creating it is more important than whether you're closed to sale today or not. Because some sales are closed and some sales aren't, but your practice remains. And a good practice always leads to better outcomes than racing around like a ping pong ball from one thing to another. You're in the story business. And in a world that's upside down, where there isn't enough justice, where people are seeking firm footing, where there is way too much division, there is a shortage of stories. Stories that will connect us, stories that will elevate us, stories that will make things better. And I'm going to use up less of my time than I promised because I really want to talk to Mark. So Mark, come on back. Let's chat. He's getting a coffee. Oh, there you go. Hey, man. Coffee. Yeah, absolutely. You know what's so funny? Seth and I were talking just just beforehand. And we were talking about technical problems. And I clicked the publish button. And I think I was just sitting there. And there was this little button that said, going live, going live. And I'm sitting there and I'm live with Seth <laughs> That was awesome. <laughs> I'm glad that we recorded that. Uh, Seth, so first of all, thank you so much for all the great work that you do. Um, we, I've had the pleasure to interview you on a few different occasions over the years. And just as I said in my introductory remarks, um, the work that you've put out into the world uh, genuinely changed how it is that I thought about my business, my distributor business at the time. And then, of course, with Common Skew that was started a few years later. And I know that the work has also impacted so many other people that are um, in the promotional products industry as well. So thank you. a group, thank you for that. So I want to talk a little bit about your new book, The Practice. Um, for those that haven't read it, do you want to talk about the thesis of the book and why it is that it matters more than ever right now? Fork in the road. Either you're a cog in the machine racing to the bottom soon to be replaced by a computer or somebody cheaper than you, or you're on the other side in which you are doing human work, creative work, work that might not work, work that's new, work that involves interaction. That creative work, call it art if you want, is our job to ship creative work. And I had not come across anything that I could hand somebody and say, this is what it is like to commit to a profession of showing up without reassurance, denying that writer's block exists, being in the world as a productive creative. And, you know, I started talking to people in this industry 20 something years ago. And 20 something years ago, people were sounded like taxi drivers dismissing Uber, right? Oh, that we're not really worried about the internet. I gotta tell you, everybody's a click away now. And so if you really think that you know more than your customer about that thing you're selling and that you can sell it to them for more than someone else, you can't. But what you can do is you can be meaningful in your practice and you can approach it in a way that you are indispensable. A shorthand is this. If you are hoping that people will find you because they're searching for an item, you're not going to win. But if you can create a practice where people are searching for you by your name, you're the one and only. And that's the goal. So, Seth, many of us on this call are leaders. We own companies, manage either small and large teams. Uh, I think that the, the question that a lot of us have in leadership roles is how do we cultivate the, the ideals of the practice with those people that we manage? We may buy into it ourselves, but when it's communicating that to a colleague that is working in, say, sales or in marketing yeah. or operations, um, how do you... How do you cultivate that creative mindset in other people in your organization? Yeah, a lot of people pay lip service to this. You know, if you go out for foreign food, I don't know, to the International House of Pancakes or something, on your way to the men's room, there's all those plaques for employee of the month, right? How do you get the employee of the month plaque? You get it by showing up for your shift and doing what your manager says. Hmm. So if you are busy rewarding people for hitting their quota and rewarding people for closing profitable sales, why are you surprised that that's what they're chasing as hard as they can? Mm. On the other hand, if you say to somebody who hasn't messed up in two months, as I did once, if you don't mess up something soon, it means you're not trying hard enough and I'm going to fire you because you can't have it both ways, right? You can't say we want to be creative, but it has to work every time. Instead, what you've got to say is we need to develop a unique perspective. And the word unique means we're not copying what other people are doing. We're doing it our way. 
right. we're going to be really clear about it. And if people don't want to be our customer, they don't want to be our customer. That's okay. That's what I'm measuring, not how many sales you made this month. Right, right. I want you to retell one of the stories in the book. Uh, I, it was a, a story where you told the story of Pythagoras, uh, CSNY, and specifically the cantankerous, cantankerously Canadian Neil Young, I should say, and this concept of the fifth hammer. And the whole concept of it was, and, you, and you'll talk about it better than me, but I'll just set it up, is this, the concept that diversity is so important in a team. So yeah. first of all, I'd like you to describe the story, what it means. And then I'd like for you to talk a little bit about how we can encourage those fifth hammers amongst us. Because I think that our natural reaction is to try to repel them because they're a pain in the ass. They're, they're questioning authority. But at the end of the day, it's, those, it's, the, it's Neil Young that made CSNY so amazing. Yeah. So uh, Pythagoras was a nutcase, but he was also really good with triangles. And um, one of the things he was trying to do is understand harmony. Mm -hmm. And he walked past a blacksmith shop. And the way blacksmiths worked in the old days and still to this day is there's a lot of hammering going on. And as he passed by, he heard as they were striking in unison, this beautiful chord. So as Pythagoras was wont to do, he raced into the shop and took every single person's hammer away from them. And then he carefully weighed each hammer. And he, what he discovered is that the first four hammers built an orderly scale in weight. And he was onto something. He was discovering that the weights led to frequencies, which led to sound. But the fifth hammer didn't fit. The fifth mm -hmm. hammer was a little off. And that's why it was beautiful. And in my book, I talk about how Crosby, Stills, and Nash made beautiful harmonies, but it wasn't until Neil Young showed up, cantankerous Neil Young, just a little bit off at any given moment, that they made something that was absolutely spe spectacular. And what we have the chance to do, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the people who are sitting in your office, but in the creative work that you do, is everyone the same? Does everyone have the same point of view? Is everyone seeking the same thing? Because if so, you're going to get something that's predictable. Hmm. On the other hand, if you seek out unusual combinations, if you seek out different points of view, different backgrounds, different perceptions of privilege or whatever it is, you have a chance to do something that's actually really special. And then in, I'd, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about how we can try to bring out those people in our organizations, how we can really celebrate them. And, ma and maybe that's a comment about diversity and hiring. Um, we have an industry, Seth, that is pretty homogeneous uh, in terms of the way that a lot of us look, um, a way a lot of us think, a way a lot of us uh, approach selling and marketing. And, and I think that as a very general comment, I think the promotional products industry is one that has generally fit into this homogeneous box and it's kind of repelled that outside perspective. Maybe it's because we feel we're this protected little business. Um, any advice for how it is that we might be able to get outside of our own heads? So I, I'm, I'm riffing here from Scott Page. If you, if you go to the, listen to the Toronto All Clarinet Orchestra, you will discover that it doesn't sound very good. Um, and there are two reasons. There's no such thing as the Toronto All Clarinet Orchestra. And number two is if there was, you don't want to hear just clarinets. You need violins and trumpets and everything to make an orchestra. So Scott's point is you shouldn't go hire people who are different from you because it's the right thing to do. You should do right. it because you will actually come out ahead. And this idea that differences in background enable us to be more than clerks is the key. And I think more than a clerk is a fine slogan. Because too many people, you know, there are certain industries like real estate where it's super easy to get into the industry. And mm -hmm. because it's super easy to get into the industry, people are afraid and they try to fit in all the way. Right. Don't be a clerk because lots of people can look up the catalog number and submit the JPEGs. That if you're going to be more than a clerk, you're going to have to dance with some level of tension. Yeah. And that involves discovering the stories that people need to hear. So a little aside, a case study. Um, you may have heard of Tom's Shoes, and at its peak, it was worth $500 million. I want to explain briefly what people don't really understand about how Tom's Shoes did that, because let's start with this. Every person in North America who bought a pair of Tom's Shoes already had shoes. 
They weren't buying shoes because they needed yep. shoes. They were buying shoes because they wanted shoes. Why did they want shoes? Well, what Blake did was he put his logo on the back of a pair of espadrilles. In those days, you couldn't get a pair of dress shoes that had a logo on them. Sneakers, yes, not dress shoes. What kind of person is going to be an early adopter of that? Well, mm. as everyone knows, Tom did a one-for-one, one, buy one pair of shoes. They'll give a pair of shoes to someone in need. And you're walking down the street with these shoes on, and your friend says, wow, nice shoes. Why does she say that? Because there's a big-ass logo on the back. Right, mm. that's not supposed to happen. She's sort of shading on you a little bit, and you can turn to her and say, "I'm paraphrasing here. I'm better than you. I got these before you did, and I'm a philanthropist." So yep. in that transaction, status exchange, right? And now your friend needs to go buy a pair so that she can do this to her next friend or not be left out, right? Right. That dynamic couldn't have come from somebody who had spent their whole life in the shoe industry mm. because they knew how shoes were supposed to be. Right. It happened because someone showed up and said, what story is going to resonate with the person who's going to talk about what I do? Right. Right. It's interesting. Uh, I think you, you talk in one of your books uh, or it might've been a recent blog post about the musical Hamilton. You talk about the ultimate outsider. You think about telling the story of one of the founding fathers of, of your country in the U S from someone who was uh, a, a, an outsider in the traditional sense. And I just think that's such a magical story. I wanted to bring that up. And because our family has been so obsessed with the musical, I thought I would, uh, I thought I'd ask you this question. You talk about this idea of how it is that it's best to cater to a micro audience as opposed to this mass audience. And I'm interested in a musical like Hamilton that comes in, on the fringe, comes in serving that micro audience, comes in not looking like anything that you've seen on Broadway, at least in a long time, and completely blows up and becomes an absolute mainstream success. My question for you, and we can all understand why it's become a success because it's a genius musical, but is that the exception? Is that the lightning in a bottle? Is that the one in a million time where you try to go in through that little little nook and cranny door and then all of a sudden you're a blockbuster hit? Okay, so a couple of things I want to start with. I never use the word micro. I think we should use the word specific okay. because there's nothing wrong with being specific. In fact, it's the only way forward. The second thing I'll point out is that most people – who are listening to this would be thrilled to have a Hamilton size success on their hands. I would like to say that 99.4% of the people in the United States have never seen it, that it sold fewer than 2 million tickets. Do the math, right? Mm -hmm. I'm thrilled that the vice president of my country saw it. I hope that it resonated with him and maybe helped him stand up the other day. But the thing is that Lin-Manuel never set out to make a musical right. for everyone. He set out to make a musical for someone. And, you know, I gave a speech to the Broadway producers. There were like a hundred people who produced Broadway plays there. And they were all, they think that they need TV stars and bus ads and right. And I, they sent me this 200 page document that they had never read, that they had commissioned of all the facts and figures about Broadway. And it turns out almost no one goes. And it turns out that among the people who do go, the average person, if you go to a Broadway show after this lockdown is over, the average person has seen five shows that year alone. Think about this. Those are the people you're serving. You are not going to have a lot of luck persuading someone who has never bought a right. product like you sell to buy one. But the people who are in, who are on the bus, who get the joke, dance with them. Specific. Right not micro. Right. And it's finding those people and then they sneeze and then all of a sudden it's Disney plus and now it goes mainstream and it's such a wonderful story. I know it's a little bit of a sidebar, but I read it and I just, I, I, I just wanted to ask you. All right. Back to sales here, Seth. So in your experience, we talk about what separates the successful salesperson from the unsuccessful one when it comes to what they say yes to. Okay. Can we talk about sales for a minute? 
Because there are two ways to sell. One way to sell is to hustle, to invade someone's personal space, to play the reciprocity game, to do things to make someone momentarily uncomfortable so they say yes to get rid of you. Mm. And the other way to sell is to say that this person has a, a locked trunk in their office and the locked trunk is filled with valuable stuff and you have a key and you're willing to sell it to them for five bucks. The key is worth way more than five bucks. In fact, no one volunteers to buy anything that isn't worth more than it costs. So in fact, sales is service. You are sitting next to the other person and saying, let me understand your problem and we will either solve it together or I will get on the phone with someone who will solve it for you from another firm. Because when you do that, you build a career, you don't just make a sale. Hmm. Absolutely. And I, I had to ask you that because this is an industry of people and myself included. So I'm, I'm prepared to uh, accept, accept some of the fall for this that at least earlier in their career say yes to everything, right? You want an order, we can get it for you. Yes, 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 yes. And it, it, it doesn't become too long until you realize that you're just swimming in problems, swimming in fires. And at the end of the day, uh, you would have been much better served if you were that much more focused. So I think it's really, I, I appreciate your opinion on that. All right, last question about the book, and then we're going to move into 2021, and then we're going to talk a little bit about COVID. So you talk in the book about the difference between a hack, a professional, a failure, and an amateur. Could you highlight those? Because we might be able to identify those four uh, different uh, uh, people in our, in our business, and we can talk about uh, how it is that we can elevate ourselves to the status of professional. Okay, so we don't have enough time to go into all the details of this because it's a little complicated, but let me try. An amateur is great. I love amateurs. I am an amateur at many things. Do it because you love it. Do it because it gives you a joy. Do not sell it. If you sell the thing you are an amateur at, your hobby, you are no longer allowed to love what you do because it's for the customer. It's not for you anymore. A professional, on the other hand, makes a promise. She shows up and she says, this is going to happen. And then it does. Whether or not she's in a good mood, whether or not she feels like it, a professional shows up and keeps the promise. So the idea of authenticity when we're doing our professional work makes no sense. People don't need you to be authentic. They need you to be consistent, to be the very best version of you it is possible to be in this moment and in the next moment. And right. so amateurs get to say, I do what I love. But professionals have to say, I love what I do. Right. And that's completely different. Now, you brought up hacks. There's nothing wrong with being a hack as long as you know what it is and you're doing it on purpose. A hack says, what do you need? I've got it. A hack is completely driven by the short-term needs of the person they are serving. That's different than the artist who seeks to make change happen. That person hears what the audience wants, but gives them what they really want instead. Mm -hmm. And dances with that tension of saying, I'm not gonna play my greatest hits. I am not gonna do the easy thing. I'm gonna say to the client, you shouldn't buy that because your boss is going to hear that you shipped something crappy. Don't mm. do it. To yeah. say that, that's not the work of a hack. The hack yeah. just says, did your, did your check clear? I'll ship it yeah. to you tomorrow. And, and, and one of the mo yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead, please. No, I'm, I'm done with that rant. Well, I, I think that one of the things that was so profound in that was this concept of having a point of view, having an opinion. And that, and that's really the province of a, of a professional. And I think about my personal journey in both of my business in this industry. And I know lots of, I think my friends in this industry would feel the same way. You start off, you're a hack. You're taking every order that's out there. And it, you're, it's a bit embarrassing that the, you don't have that focus where then over time you become the go-to person that has an opinion about your client's business, what keeps them up at night. And so that way you move away from being the stress toy salesperson into yeah. someone that is the definitive expert in selling merchandise programs to summer camps in Ontario, which I know you care about. And that's of course what we became. Right. Um, 
I want to pause for a quick second. We're going to have fun with this, Seth. So I was just taking a look at at the uh, at the chat, and um, there's a couple of people, uh, and I, I'll call her out because she, she's a, a wonderful person. Don Ruler is 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 saying, "Is this session recorded?" Because Mark had a wardrobe change, and Seth's lighting looks so great. I don't think my lighting's as good as yours, but we're gonna have some fun with this. So yes, Don and everyone in this community, Seth and I are here at 5:33 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm in Toronto. He's in New York. And we are having the time of our lives right here doing this live with all of its warts. <laughs> but we're going to record it, right? Yes, we are going to record it. They could, they, we could conjugate the sentence differently. as, as <laughs> for I, want, I wanted that for posterity. Um, and I had to change my shirt because I was getting a little hot uh, with, with my other T-shirt. This event has been going on a long time. And I know you wear a tie and I had to look respectable here. All right. I want to move on to uh, 2021. Seth, I emailed you on um, December 24th when you wrote this blog post that stopped me in my uh, stopped me in my tracks. It's called "The Seeds We Plant," and in it you talk about the importance of planting seeds, regardless of the climate we find ourselves in. You reference tragedies like forest fires. I'm going to equate that to something like COVID, giving birth to Sylvan Glades. That's your term, a bright COVID or sorry, a bright post COVID future is how I might relate that to a Sylvan Glade. What can we as salespeople learn from this reference given the challenges of 2020? You know, a lot of time when I'm running a workshop or talking, people are saying, I need to hear ideas that will help me get back to the way I think things should be right? That I've decided I want to be a famous actor. Give me all the steps to become a famous actor. Yeah. And I was talking to um, somebody who does theater stuff last week. And I said, if you want to understand what the gift of this lockdown has been with all of the tragedy and dislocation and harm for actors, it's simple. You can't be on stage to learn to write. Because if you write the screenplay, they have to cast you. Because yeah. if you write the play, they have to let you be in it. And what an opportunity to redefine how you're going to spend your day, which is not going on auditions, but having people call you up because it's different, right? And the same thing can work in this industry because first of all, we've definitely seen a gap in live events. So a lot of the stuff that people here created for live events doesn't have a place because there aren't any live events. That Zoom has transformed the way that people will take a meeting. So I think the days of the 45 minute sales call in person are totally limited forever because why don't I just get on Zoom with you for six minutes? Because then I can get back to what I was doing. How are you gonna practice that? How are you gonna develop a competence in that? How are you gonna become somebody who learns to organize? Mm. Because the fact is if you organize five people in an industry, they will come to see each other. And if you're at the table, your business can't help but go up. And right. I know that you're working summer camps. You know, if you can say to Joanne Cates, you should talk to this person at this summer camp because they're dealing with the same issue. Well, the next time Joanne needs sweatshirts, who else is she going to call? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So Seth, you're an entrepreneur, just like many of us that are at this event. Um, I recall attending one of your sessions about a year ago, and you were talking about how your the Seth Godin world tour was canceled. You'd order a bunch of merchandise, in fact. You were very kind to send me one of your sweatshirts, which was uh, uh, cherished. And It's I, cherished, I, but cursed. I caused the entire <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> That's what, Maybe I should put that on right now and we could uh, you know, do another wardrobe change. <laughs> um, but seriously, my question is, so as a fellow entrepreneur, you had this incredible world tour set up, fair amount of revenue, presumably, that was swept from under your feet. How has, how has COVID been a gift for you, Seth, in your business as a teacher, as someone that writes and someone that inspires other people? Has it, or has it been a gift? Um, well, the semantics get tricky. There's a guy who used to be the world surfing champion and he built a farm in California, five miles inland, flooded it and put a railroad track in it with a train. 
and the train has a snow plow in the front. And Kelly charges people 500 bucks to come to his ranch. And the train plows through the lake and the snow plow makes a perfect wave every single time. And most surfers hate it because the purpose of surfing is that every wave is different. And when every wave is the same, it might be training, but it's not surfing. And I think there's enough Buddhist teaching in the world to help us understand if you want to be alive, you're not allowed to just get the greatest hits. Mm. That tragedy is as much a part of being alive as joy. And so I think for a year that I'm eager to forget, and I think a lot of other people are, what it did was help me understand that time is short, that uh, attention is scarce, that the number of chances we're going to get to help somebody find a story that they're going to live inside and remember and that will elevate them is very finite. And sometimes it's easy if you're on the treadmill of one wave after the other to say, it's Tuesday, this must be Rome. And I think this has been an opportunity and will going forward, I'm wishing everyone the best of health to say, wait a minute, how am I going to cherish this even if it today really sucks? Yeah. yeah. Ah, from the closet. You're there we amazing, go. Catherine. Thank you. This is amazing that we were able to do this recorded, right, Seth? <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Look at this phenomenal piece. It's sublimated. It's wonderful. And I'll tell you, so uh, if, 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 to, to, to give you a sense... I think this was a Facebook Live that you had done, Seth, and 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 I think I, you, you talk about you the the commitment and care that you have for the people who who are part of your audience or your fans or your tribe. I threw a comment in here how I said that I was sad that you weren't distributing your sweatshirts, and within about five days, I had a wonderful package from your team with this sweatshirt what? that arrived in my it's office. Not from my team. I don't have a team. <laughs> I it don't. Was from you. It was from me. And that's very kind. I don't have any left. Um, but the idea that there are humans in the world who get the joke, who care, who turn on lights for other people, if I can help somebody like that feel seen and encouraged, that's a good day for me. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. And, and, and the cameo there from Catherine. Um, all right. I, I, uh, there's so much that we can talk about. I've got a, a bunch more questions here, but certainly respectful of your time. Um, one of the things that you write, Seth, is, quote unquote, attitudes are skills and good taste is a skill. What do you mean by that? All right, so let's start with the first one. Uh, we understand that typing is a skill and juggling is a skill. They can be learned. You can decide. What about trustworthiness, honesty, respect, treating people with dignity? Well, you didn't do any of those things when you were three. So where did they come from? You learn them and you can do them more. We know you can do them more. Each of us can if we choose to practice the skill. So there's skills. This is great news, as my friend Zig Ziglar taught me. It's great news because if there's skills, you can go get them if you want them. And one of the skills is good taste. And in writing the practice, I couldn't find any definition of good taste that made any sense to me. So I made one up and no one has helped me make it better. So here we go. Good taste is knowing what your customers want just before they do. And so some musicians have good taste because no one's heard that record before and it comes out and we go, that, I really like that. Well, because they have good taste. And where do you get good taste? You get good taste from domain knowledge, from doing the reading from putting your work into the world and watching what happens. Mm. And you can't get good taste by yourself in the dark. You get good taste by being in the world and choosing who it's for and being able to say this, I made this because I think it's gonna turn on a light for you. Too often we default to being a hack and say, what do you want? And then when we do that, we're giving that other person the responsibility for having good taste when it should be your job because you know more about this domain than your customer does. Hmm. Seth, I want to switch gears. What's your favorite book? Two questions. 
that you wrote and from someone else? The book that was uh, the one that changed my life the most was Lynchpin, followed by The Practice. Uh, both took a very long time and they changed the way I looked at things. The book that sold the fewest copies is called Survival is Not Enough. It took the longest to write, seven hours a day, every day for a year, but it's about evolution. So some people aren't crazy about that. Um, which book have I read that um, is my favorite? Favorite so hard with somebody else's book. I think, you know, if I, if I look at a book like uh, Cast uh, by Isabel Wilkerson, uh, that's the book of 2020. It's the book that mm -hmm. everybody needs to read. If I look at a life's work, something like The Gift by Lewis Hyde, something like The Art of Possibility by Ben and Roz Zander, something like Debt by David Graeber, these are seminal works. This is why books were invented, because 50 years from now, it doesn't matter if there's electricity. It doesn't matter uh, what operating system you've got. 50 years from now, you can put one of those books off the shelf, and it will change your mind. There's there's a, a a riff of yours, Seth. I think you've said something. If you want to do something really well, you have to be bad at it for much longer. And I, I don't think I'm paraphrasing it all that well, but I will often say it to my kids. If if my kids, one of them is frustrated about playing piano or playing the saxophone, I say, well, you need to play a lot of bad saxophone first before you're going to play good saxophone. And they roll their eyes and go, oh gosh, dad, you're so lame. But it, it's something that you wrote about some time ago. And, and I think about it often when we get frustrated as marketers or salespeople in, in this business. It's like, what do you expect? And, and I think that, um, so I'd love to just have you riff about that a little bit, because I think that there's a lot of frustration amongst salespeople in our line of work where they say, I couldn't get past the decision maker. I couldn't, I didn't land this deal. And at the end of the day, I think that it requires this commitment, this practice, so to speak, to doing a lot of bad work before it's going to get really great. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, that's what it means to be a professional. So Glenn Gould showed up and played and played and played, and then he kept playing after everyone else stopped. And when he brought out the Brandenburg Concertos, he was just ridiculed by critics because you could hear his breathing. And he established a different standard of naturalness for how a musician would show up for the piano. I guarantee you the first day, week, month, year that Glenn Gould played the piano, wasn't that good at it. So you're telling me you didn't close the sale? You're telling me you couldn't get past the, the decision maker? Well, because you weren't that good. Let's figure out why you weren't that good. Because it's not about your standard of good. It's clear that that person who was making a decision said, you didn't tell me a story that was worth the money the story cost. Because if you had, mm -hmm. I would have handed over the money to instantly. Right? right? That if the story isn't worth what you're charging, you never make the sale. Right. So Seth, if you're okay, I'd, I'd love to ask maybe two or so questions from the audience and then I think uh, we, can, we can wrap this up. Um, so I, I, I'd, I'd love to continue on that theme. So there's a question that came in from Rich Graham. And the question was, how do you tell a story to a buyer that's not necessarily the decision maker, the one that writes the check? And so his concern is we seem to have a lot of admin buyers that are just sourcing stuff and don't care about a story? I think I know what your answer is, but I'd love for you to answer this uh, on behalf of Rich. Right. So if you're contacted by somebody who will only be able to raise their status with the boss by getting the cheapest one, you should not do business with that person. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be angry at them. You should open the door for when they need what you have, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I went to college, people used to go, uh, to a college I didn't go to, to the coop, to buy a poster for their room. And a poster for your room costs $7. And if you walk into a gallery on Newberry Street and say, I'd like one of those $7 posters, they don't say you're an idiot. They don't say you're a bad person. They just say, we don't sell $7 posters. That what it means to buy a piece of fine art is you get a different emotional set. You get a different asset. You get everything's different. So when someone says, I'm dialing for dollars, can you beat this price for water bottles? The answer is, 
No, but when you're really ready to impress your customers and your boss and sit with us to do business the way we do business, we'll be here. And in the meantime, we'll keep selling to your competitors. Right. And, and I mean, it's, it's wonderful advice and, and maybe just a bit of pushback on that, Seth. What do you say to a distributor of promotional products who has, uh, let's say, maybe 75% of their contacts are the person that we just talked about? This admin person yeah. whose job it is to go farm out the best possible price and they can't get past this person. Um, and, and selling to admin people is not necessarily a bad target. Is there a way, is there a way of, of, of inspiring them to think beyond the numbers, to think beyond just that, that better price? Because surely these admin people can be inspired through stories, no? Don't call me Shirley. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the, there are two answers to the question. The first answer is travel agents used to ask me that question all the time when they were talking about how do I get someone to not use Travelocity and TripAdvisor and everything else, they don't, they're not travel agents anymore. And my friend who staked out her position of a very specific sort of travel is as busy as ever because the world doesn't owe you that someone's mm. going to pay extra for a thing. And if you can't find the people who need your story, then you need a different story. But right. In the case that you're talking about, the way that I would consider it is this. Non-ironically, um, appropriately, the things you send people are what you do for a living. Yeah. And if you can't figure out how to show up with something on that admin's desk that he or she wants to brag about, then you're probably not as good at this as you think you are. Right. And if the admin realizes that bragging about this thing they got makes their life better, they will brag about it. And if they start bragging about it, there's a chance that you will show up in front of someone who can make a decision. But yeah. beyond that, much bigger is I would find a set of either competitors or things that are aligned. And I'd say, I'm the best at that, this yeah. special thing, right? And I'd start a newsletter just for people who care about that special thing, highlighting yeah. one competitor after another who's doing great with that one thing. Yeah. Because now the recipient, well, here's an easy way to remember it. How did Tesla become the most valuable company? Because the Model S broke every Mercedes in California. What does that mean? It means that as soon as the first Model S went down 101 in California, Anyone who is driving a Mercedes, who've been telling themselves the story of, I'm a good parent, I have a safe car, I have an expensive car, I have a lot of status, and I have the latest best, none of that's true anymore. Hmm. So in that moment, the existence undid the story of the competition. Yeah. You can do that same thing by creating not a different kind of water bottle. No, it's not going to help. A different process and understanding and experience so that when people look around and they say, what am I going to tell my boss? They better get a piece of you because otherwise they're in trouble. I, I love it. And it reminds me of the approach that I took uh, in, in my time at Right Sleeve. And I really felt that what my job was, was to make my customer contact look good in front of their stakeholder, mm -hmm. in front of their boss or in front of their customer. Because a, a lot of the times you're dealing with people that are in mid-level positions in this industry and they're people that are craving that, that uh, acknowledgement uh, of a job well done from their boss that doesn't want to deal with this. And you can come in and make them look like a superstar. You've got a customer for life. So um, it can certainly be very uh, challenging at times, but uh, I always felt that right. that's and really it doesn't always have to be the item. In fact, it might not be. I mean, like in the case of that sweatshirt I sent you, the woman who I worked with, that's all she does. Yeah, And so I knew that I wasn't going to have to revisit my thing. I didn't have a lot of time to get it right, right? But it was really expensive to get it wrong. Yep. And that was really clear. I would hope that the people who are listening as we start to wrap this up, here's what your motto could be. You'll pay a lot, but you get more than you pay for. Because some of your clients want that. Absolutely. 
Seth, I got one bonus question for you on behalf of Rich Patterson. And I think Rich Patterson actually speaks for everyone who's watching this right now. What's the deal with the 250 on your mug? Oh, um, I buy a lot of weird stuff on the internet. And I used to have people in my office before March 4th, but now I don't. Um, and this is a company that just puts random numbers on mugs so that you know it's your tea, not somebody else's tea. You just remembered this. I got like four of them. And I usually use a different mug when I'm speaking, but I knew I was going to be here with you for a while and I needed the biggest one in the office. That's all. That's my story. <laughs> Wait, is it because I blab on too much? Is that why? <laughs> no, because sometimes I do a 20 minute talk. That's a small mug. This was a longer one. Yeah, that's great. Well, Seth Godin, thank you so much. This was such a pleasure. Uh, we are so fortunate to, to, to have had uh, 45 minutes with you on behalf of the of the whole promotional products industry and certainly the common ski community and, and from Catherine and myself, a, a deep and very heartfelt thank you. Well, thank you. Go make a ruckus, everybody. It was good to talk. Cheers, Cheers to 2021. <laughs> good to see you, Catherine.